OK, so the um, my talk today is a, a spin off from my PhD research, <clears throat> which is uh, socio legal empirical research looking at a new criminal justice actor known as the intermediary. Uh, and the first question people ask me when they hear about my research is who is the intermediary? So I, I'm hoping at the end of this talk, you'll be um, a bit clearer as to who the intermediary is and how it relates to today's topic. <clears throat> so a little bit of background to the talk today and also to my thesis generally is that it, it probably is no surprise to you that um, the population of, of prisoners and also the population of suspects and defendants who come into contact with the criminal justice system tend not to be a represent, representative of the, the population as a whole. Um, that could be because of gender, race, socioeconomic class. Um, but in particular, I'm going to focus on vulnerability and the fact that People with mental health disorders, um, learning disabilities tend to be overrepresented in the population of people who come into contact with the criminal justice system. <clears throat> now, the problem, two problems that arise from that, uh, problems of, among many. Firstly, is that vulnerability is actually very difficult to define. It's quite an amorphous term. Uh, and secondly, vulnerability, particularly communication problems, which my thesis is looking at, tend to be very difficult to detect. So, for example, uh, police forces in Northern Ireland and England and Wales have a statutory duty to screen uh, witnesses uh, in, at the police uh, investigative stage for vulnerabilities, communication problems. Um, but that in, in practice, in some forces is easier than others and, and police are working hard to try and improve their systems in that. However, police do not actually owe a duty to screen defendants <clears throat> or suspects at that stage. And it's at this point when the inequalities between um, suspects and witnesses really start to emerge, and that's the, the, the focus of my research. But the, the defendant has a particular um, role, central role in the criminal process, particularly the criminal trial, and that sort of central player uh, role that they assume means that they have procedural rights in the same way that uh, victims and witnesses don't, not to the same extent. So the, the, the right that I'm focusing on today and also my research is this right to effective participation. Now, this is a derivative right from Article 6, the right to a fair trial. And it is reflective of the fact that defendants have the most to lose from the criminal trial and they are a central player, as I said. And I'm going to come back to what effective participation means in practice and how it links into um, uh, the theme today of my, of my talk. But just focusing on this point of the intermediary for a second, and, and this is what my thesis is looking at. Um, who is the intermediary and what's it got to do with uh, this topic today? Well, the intermediary is a creature of statute from the Youth Justice and Criminal Evidence Act 1999. And the intermediary, to be blunt and put it straight, is a person, it's a human being. And they are normally speech and language therapists, uh, psychologists, social workers. Um, and as I said, they're communication experts who are there to facilitate communication between vulnerable individuals and the criminal justice system. So that can be assessing vulnerable people to detect what communication problems they have um, speaking to judges, lawyers, police officers, trying to understand how the environment in which they find themselves in can be better um, uh, tailored to particular communication issues. And also quite, quite frequently in court, whenever questions are being asked um, to witnesses um, by lawyers and judges, that questions are comprehensible and that the answers given in response are comprehensible. Now, uh, interestingly, in England and Wales anyway, this um, statutory right to an intermediary, this communication expert, is only available to uh, witnesses and complainants. Defendants are actually excluded from the, the procedures. Now, you might think oh, that's very strange considering everything you've told us about defendants being particularly vulnerable with communication problems, and that's true. But what has happened is that judges uh, have stepped into the breach or attempted to using their inherent jurisdiction to appoint an intermediary. And the basis for which this communication expert can be appointed for defendants is the right to effective participation, which derives from Article 6. So in other words, judges stepping in to allow this equal provision of intermediaries to ensure that defendants have their fair trial rights um, upheld. Interestingly, uh, Northern Ireland is actually ahead of the curve on this because if you're a suspect, if you're a witness or a defendant at court, you have e there's equal provision, equal access to intermediaries across the board. <clears throat> we don't have this distinction in Northern Ireland between 
uh, intermediaries for witnesses and intermediaries for defendants. And I could speak for an hour about that alone, but I'll have to keep it a small thread throughout my research and I'll, I'll come back to that towards the end. So I've, I've mentioned intermediaries, um, I've mentioned effective participation, but what does it mean? So we all know the term participation, but what does it mean to effectively participate? <clears throat> Well, the European Court of Human Rights has given us some indication as to what this means in practice from the SCE case. And the court has said that effective participation means the accused must have a broad understanding of the nature of the trial process. Uh, they should be able to understand the general thrust of what is said in court. And um, that essentially means that the defendant should be able to follow what's going on, should be able to converse with their lawyers, should be able to understand the significance of a penalty imposed. Um, and, and these are some of the factors which go towards effective participation. Now, effective participation is a right of all defendants, but you can imagine, based on the limited information I've told you today, that if you're a particularly vulnerable defendant with communication problems, whether it's autism, Asperger's, um, if you've got mental health complications, the right to effective particip participation attains um, even more significance because the, the criminal justice system and even the particularly archaic ways in which criminal trials are run marginalizes defendants at the best of times. So this idea of vulnerability and communication problems means that ensuring effective participation really, really does attain that much more um, that significance and can be, it can be harder to do. And I've, I've put the quote there at the bottom from Owusu Bemba that what exactly effective participation means is uncertain. It's very fact dependent. <clears throat> now, I, I don't want you to think based on my research that the intermediary is the answer to all participation problems, but it's one tool which the court can use to ensure that the accused has um, a right, their right to effective participation upheld. Other things, of course, will be um, access to legal representation, proper visual lines in the court, proper acoustics being able to follow sentencing. But the intermediary plays a very important part in equalizing the sort of injustices and deficiencies of communication that the criminal justice throws up for defendants. <clears throat> so it is a very important tool to play in ensuring that the right is upheld. <clears throat> okay, what's this got to do with the present topic and remote justice? That's what we're really focusing on today. Well, there's no doubt that the rise in use of video hearings, uh, video trials, virtual trials, stands to threaten or at least risks um, uh, participatory rights of defendants throughout the criminal justice system. It, it makes everything that bit harder in, in, in simple terms. Um, but if you're a vulnerable defendant, <clears throat> if you're a vulnerable individual going through the criminal justice system, being able to effectively participate is possibly, and I would say even probably, more difficult to achieve if you have communication problems. And Cooper recognizes this in her recent work. She says the fact that we need to reconsider what participation means and that uh, the use of video hearings, video conferences, potentially creates barriers to participation. Things like connectivity issues, use of videos or telephones, makes it harder for the vulnerable individual who normatively should be at the center of the proceedings and who stands to risk, or sorry, stands to lose the most. Um, we need to really rethink about how the most vulnerable individuals or court users um, are able to effectively participate. And Justice, who ran two virtual trials recently using video hearings, concluded that there are real fair trial concerns as to how vulnerable people can navigate the system and also how their fair trial rights can be upheld. <clears throat> so as the key player in the criminal trial, defendants do risk being the biggest casualties um, of remote justice done wrong. So we really need to be careful about how we think about vulnerability and, and effective participation. But for the focus of my research in particular, how the intermediary, it's not a, 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 an, a tool that will answer all of our concerns, but it really has the potential to ameliorate a lot of the participatory concerns that, that exist. And, and um, going forward, we really need to think about that. So I'm very aware of the clock and it really time does catch up with you when you're presenting. Um, I just want to finish on this last slide <clears throat> uh, and bring this all back because I've spoken about participation, remote justice, and I really want us to think going forward about what questions does the intermediary role have to, um, what has to be borne in mind going forward. Now I, I've, I've formulated these four questions based on conversations I've had with some intermediaries in practice. <clears throat> 
um, who since March or April have done a lot of their work uh, using video hearings and even video assessments. And the virtual environment poses complications for everybody. But if you're a vulnerable user who um, needs to have their communication needs assessed, doing that remotely over video causes complications, especially when communication is so bespoke and so individual centered. How can the lack of physical proximity affect intermediaries and vulnerable defendants? Um, and how might vital interactions between intermediaries, lawyers, um, and defendants be affected by um, remote justice. So for example, the, the fourth bullet point here, um, how can intermediaries remain involved? Now the, the virtual trials that I mentioned that Justice have ran, they've run two virtual trials to see the effect of video hearings. They were able to have a separate room where intermediaries and interpreters could meet with the lawyers and, and, and defendants to have virtual conferences to try and make up for the lack of face-to-face -face contact. And that seems to be a, a positive. But <clears throat> I'm really going to finish in this point because I know the clock's against me. So I'll finish in this um, point and provoke some questions for going forward. Could we think about remote justice potentially removing barriers to participation? So one of the reasons why intermediaries were introduced in the first place for witnesses was to reduce the stress and anxiety involved with giving justice in the criminal, uh, giving evidence in the criminal justice system. Well, could the use of virtual hearings and, and giving evidence by a video link and being able to contact the court and, and appear by a, by a video, if that could be shown to reduce the stress? Well, in fact, video hearings potentially bring a lot of opportunities for, for participation going forward. So it's not necessarily all a doom and gloom scenario. And, and Penny Cooper in her report says that participation means different things to different people at different times. So we really need to adopt a more holistic attitude to it and think outside the box about how going forward participation could be both suffer setbacks because of remote justice, but also let's see if we can harness the power of it and see if we can potentially increase participation with um, virtual hearings um, and the use of videos and the like. So I'm going to finish on that point, Megan, and I'm really, really keen to hear some questions at the end because um, it's always good to hear new perspectives. OK, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much for that, John. Um, very interesting and very timely, of course, as well. Um, 